Hello and welcome to Talking Heads episode 5. This week we're going to be doing a vlogging special. No, not vlogging, not blogging, vlogging, which means video blogging. I had to look that up this morning. Before we dive into this week's episode, I just want to say uh, thanks for, for watching the previous episodes. Last week we had an adventure special with Nick Sanders and... Uh, had some really good comments from that. Nick was an amazing guest, really entertaining and informative. But uh, some shout outs to some of the YouTube uh, uh, comments we got to Rob Holloway, Carol and Dave, Rob Bike Bob, and some fella calling himself the Mr. Flyer for their nice comments. But thanks to everyone for watching and um, commenting. So in future episodes, let us know what you want to see more of or what you want to see less of. I'd also like to say thank you to our sponsor for this week's episode, to Sparda Clothing. If you don't know who Sparda are, go to spardaclothing.co.uk, find out all the lovely stuff that they do for motorcyclists, clothing and accessories. Joining me today is John Milbank, Bike Social's consumer editor and uh, a serial video maker, self-taught. He's produced, directed, scripted, starred in, funded, um, Pretty much uh, most of his videos that he puts out on Bike Social, incredible stuff on, on how he tests products and, and bike reviews uh, and how-to guides. John, uh, how long have you been making videos Is it on our vlogging special and uh, you know, what's your secret to kind of making a great video? Yeah, I wouldn't say I've got a secret, especially not with Andy here, you look at the numbers, but um, I, uh, three years since I've been at Bennett's. Um, I've, I've been into photography since I was at school. It's my most enduring hobby. Uh, I'm really into photography. I'm also like, I love the trying to work out how to set things up and composition and the technicalities behind um, photography and, and uh, hence video. But uh, I honestly couldn't give you tips on how to make a great video because I think if you look at the numbers of what we do, some of the videos that I've made have done really well. Some of them are like, you think, why, why has nobody looked at that? But but I think part of a good success story on YouTube is to, to be known, known for doing, doing something, something and doing it really well. And, and I, I think, think for Bennett's, Bennett's we're doing a lot of different things, things which is great, but, but people, people don't, don't say, say, hey, they, they do, do those videos, videos, they do that style. Um, but for anybody getting into it, really, it's just enjoy, enjoy yourself, yourself and be honest. One thing that I really took from somebody was um, when I was doing all the videos about the Yamaha Nikon or the Nikon, uh, I was getting really negative then about all the, the comments people were leaving about the, video, about the bike saying it's a trike and you're not a proper biker if you ride this and uh, you need stabilizers and i was getting more and more arsy in the videos and somebody said oh, sorry how good actually saying mate that just don't be so negative because i think a lot of people the majority of people probably enjoy a video and think oh that was good i watched something else but it's easy to get dragged down by the negative comments the people who feel the need to criticize or stick their oar in or, or say something so i think the main thing really is don't get too despondent hopefully but I'd say Andy's probably got some better advice for doing this right. Well, let me introduce uh, our other guest, uh, Andy, mainly known as The Missing and Fryer. Big hit on YouTube, over 156,000 YouTube subscribers, Andy. Yeah, nuts. And you're, this is your full-time job now, and uh, yeah, we wanted to obviously bring you on. Um, we sponsor your channel, but you know, we've been, I've been watching your videos for a long time in a previous life as well we we met and wanted to bring you on to to help us with our uh, with our episode and talk about what it's like to make a great video and yeah do you want to introduce yourself and how how you came to be such a big star of youtube <laughs> sure thing i'm not sure i recognize big star but it's uh, very kind of you to say so i've seen the um, plaque so in your yeah. toilet <laughs> <laughs> so for me my story is very similar to many um other people on youtube as far as i can gather because i've asked lots of people this question myself and I'm sort of an unintended YouTuber in that, like uh, John, I've been a pretty much a lifelong um, photographer. Uh, I got my first SLR, I remember, for Christmas when I was uh, eight. It was an old uh, practica, a Russian thing, a manual thing. Anyway, um, so I've always enjoyed taking photographs. And then um, I've always done things that were sort of, uh, you could say, were kind of action oriented, although I'm definitely not an action man in any way. Uh, so I enjoy skiing, I enjoy uh, flying light aircraft, which is what I'm called the Missing Flyer, and motorcycling. Uh, and so when um, action cameras, things like GoPros first came out about, uh, about, about 10, 12 years ago now, the first ones came out, um, I thought to myself, I might have to be doing enough of these things that actually warranted me splashing out some cash on one, because they were quite expensive at the time. And uh, so I got myself a little GoPro with the intention of just uh, teaching myself how to edit video, having done so much uh, still photography in the past. 
Um, did a bit of that. I put them on YouTube, just really to share with friends and family. This is the bit of the story that is the same with many other YouTubes, it seems. And then I was surprised when people, other people started to watch them. Um, and in particular, they used to watch my biking one. So after a few um, years of doing just the odd occasional video, I, um, I decided to just focus on the motorcycling ones because they were the ones that were getting traction. Uh, and kind of the, the rest is history as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I mean, I only really started doing it properly about three years ago. But that's when I sort of classed myself becoming a, in quotes, vlogger. Because uh, you're right, I now do it full time. Although I wouldn't say it was necessarily my job. But there are some two critical differences between doing this and actually having a job. Uh, I can tell you what they are if you like. Um, but um, so, yeah, so I've been at this now properly, putting a lot of time into it for the last three years. And I absolutely love every aspect of it. And it's fantastic. I mean, I have got some hints and tips for would-be vloggers if you're interested. I want to know what you were going to say about it being the difference between a job, the two, the two main things. Then I want the tips. I hope I hope I can remember what that was. Yeah, there are two there are two big differences. The first one is you don't get paid very much, so that's that's the first one. That's a, so don't go into it thinking you're going to get rich because that won't happen. You need to sort of be okay in the first place. I mean, although this is my full time job in quotes, it's not how I make my living. There's a big difference. Um, and the other thing is I can't remember. It'll come back to me in a minute. There was something else for it. Oh yeah, that was the other thing. The other thing is it's fun. I enjoy doing this. This is basically as I said, you know, from when I started, this is a hobby of mine. So I've managed to make a hobby into something that I now do all the time. And, uh, you know, advice to kids out there, youngsters thinking about what they're going to do for a job, whatever, find something you like doing and just do that. And, uh, uh, and that way you're onto a winner. Hopefully the money will come uh, as a result of that because the sort of your enjoyment of it will mean that you'll do a lot of it and you'll probably, you know, you'll get to a reasonable level at it and, and all that stuff flows on. So that's uh, that's all that was about. My my two two boys who are 11 and 9, that's what they want to be when they're older. They want to be a professional YouTuber. I mean, I wanted to be a professional wrestler, motorcycle racer, footballer, truck driver. Um, none of those things. Don't happen. fancy your chances against Big Daddy, Luke, if I may say. I don't know, small and fast. <laughs> Um, but that's what they want to be now. And uh, you know, you said about getting rich, but then you see some of the, the YouTubers who, you know, the, particularly the gaming ones, you know, uh, and the views that they get. Um, and that's what my kids are inspired, you know, uh, aspire to be. Um, my, my youngest son put his first YouTube video out the weekend and it was a gaming one. He, uh, what well, was Minecraft. He, you know, he made something really pretty cool on Minecraft, but then he wanted to put it out there. So we edited it together, picture in picture, but uh, I think a good thing, the difference about motorcycles is you can actually get out and do things. Yeah, yeah. Of course, the thing is that, I mean, there are there are mega successful YouTubers. I'm sure most of us that are watching this watch them, you know, the Casey Neistats of the world and all the others. And of course, uh, they're extremely good at what they're doing there, but they are, you know, the fact is they are very, very few and far between. How many other thousands of channels out there are there that uh, you don't watch or only have got, you know, a handful of subscribers, whatever. So uh, I think you've got to go into it thinking not necessarily it's going to take off Massively, you might get lucky, and maybe that will happen. But uh, you know, there's an awful lot more that don't. And I mean, even in and if you, and also it depends what niche you choose. So I, I went down that motorcycling route because that was just something I was interested in. Um, but let's face it, there's not that many motorcycle or people that watch motorcycling uh, videos in the UK. So um, you know, the, so hence you're never going to get a massive following. So. You, you mentioned at the start of the video, um, I've got, I think, 155,000 subscribers, something like that. Uh, but that's that makes me one of the bigger YouTubers in the UK. And, and then compared to YouTubers generally, that's a tiny number. So, um, yeah, it's quite hard, I think, if you're going to go into the motorcycling niche, like you say, get yourself into gaming or, or makeup, and then you're onto a winner. I think what you said about it being part, sorry, look, uh, being part of something else is important. For you, you know, you've got your, your everything you've worked at in your whole life and career before that, that. And for me, making video is um, like a fun side part of my job, which is you know testing kit and bikes and stuff like that. And the, the video stuff kind of just spins off. I tend to do video where I need to, to support something and say, hey, look, I, I need to be able to show you this. Uh, and sometimes you just think, hey, this is cool. And, but I totally agree. I, we always say to our daughter, uh, just try your best at school because do your best. And when you come out, you'll get to do something you like. Uh, you can choose what you want to do. and. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I think we're all lucky, aren't we? I mean, Luke and I worked a bike magazine when we started out, and uh, yeah, doing something you love makes a massive difference. You're going to spend a lot of time doing whatever you choose to do your living. So even regardless of the monetary aspect, it makes a lot of just logical sense to do something you like doing. I spent uh, 25, maybe slightly more years doing something that fundamentally I didn't like. It made good money, but there's more to life than that, and uh, it took me a long time to learn that lesson. So heed that, kids. <laughs> so how many videos do you think you've made now, Andy? How many have I made or do I make? Or have you made? 
to, to... Uh, I think uh, I haven't checked recently but you, when you look on your main page I think it says how many I, I've got I think uh, probably between five and eight hundred videos up there now I mean it's a it's a crazy amount um, I did when I first when I started doing this as I said more seriously about three years ago I thought right I'm gonna go for it now I made three videos a week every week for basically three solid years without any breaks um, and that uh, and that, there's definitely a bit of consistency helps if you do that. Uh, now I do now I make two videos a week just because I want a bit of a life outside of YouTube. But it's a very uh, all encompassing thing. Again, because I enjoy it, it's very easy just to keep, you know just crack on and, and just do YouTube is is my life. But uh, you know I do have a family and, and stuff uh, and other things that I have to get done unfortunately. Yeah, and it's the editing that takes time, isn't it? It's all good fun shooting a video and then you think, oh, I've got to put this. Well. Place. This is it. There's there's more to it than uh, you might possibly think just by watching the odd video. The actual videoing part of uh, being a YouTuber, and I, I find it bizarre that I refer to myself as that now, uh, is a minor part. So I was fil I actually made a little film this morning in my garage. Probably took me about half an hour to do the actual filming. Um, but you know, a few days either side of that, I'm not doing any filming. It's all the sort of the planning. I do actually do a sort of a script for mine. I don't not don't write things down word for word, but I build an outline. You know, I plan it. Um, then, like you say, the editing takes an awful lot of time. Then there's a load of st techy stuff around uploading and optimising the videos, not to mention all the planning in the first place, working out what you can do, scheduling, uh, and then all the social media that goes with it that you have to be into these days. And, uh, and of course, answering comments. I try and answer as many comments as I can. And that's something that, uh, you know, I probably answer, I would say on an average day, 200 comments a day. Um, so, you know, that's a massive, you don't have to do that. I do that because I, um, I decided that, you know, if people are taking the time to watch your videos and take the time to write something to you, that's the least you can do to write back. But it is getting to the stage that it's, that's getting a bit difficult. So, uh, and, and YouTube will give you this option to put a little heart now next to a comment that you've read. So they're not always questions. So I do skip sometimes and just give it a little heart. But, uh, but yeah, that's a, that's a big drain on time too, which obviously people don't necessarily think of that because it's not, they just see your latest video. I'm still answering comments on videos I put out five years ago. <laughs> Speaking of videos like five years ago, you said how many you've made. Do you, do you watch your first videos now? <clears throat> Obviously bearing in mind, like you said, you, you made these for fun. Do you watch them now and, and cringe or do you, you just, the lessons that you've learned making them or you know how much you've developed or do you just not watch them? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't watch them that much. They haven't got that much time, and I and you watch them so many times when you edit them, you know them pretty much all off by heart anyway. Um, but I, I do. I funny enough, I watched an older one earlier because I was just um, enjoying the fact that I'd lost a bit of weight. Um, but watching the video back was. Um, I wouldn't say I was cringing at it because, of course, you, you all learn and you get better as you go along. And of course, you gain confidence in front of the camera, that sort of thing. This sort of stuff isn't natural to most people because they don't do it all the time. But now I have been doing it all the time for at least three years, possibly 12. Uh, if you go back to my when I started, uh, you do you do get more natural at it. So I don't really cringe. But, yeah, I, I do think the, um, the quality has improved and not necessarily the quality in terms of picture quality and sound quality, although that has helped because obviously technology has moved on, but just the, the fact of knowing what comes across better on camera and what doesn't. And in a way, it's good that you learn those lessons early on in your YouTube career because that's when not many people are watching. Yeah. yeah. Good point. I mean, in terms of advice for people starting out then, because you know, I talked about my kids and I've, you know, I've, I don't make as many videos as, as you, you both do. And I hate to watch them back anyway, but you know, for people starting out who really want to do this, you know, we've we've created a um, a video guide of how to make um, videos with your mobile phone that's on our um, on Bennett's Rewards. But what do people need? What's the what's the kind of basics? And, and I ask this to both of you: What's the basics you need to kind of create a video in terms of uh, equipment and also the the structure of of putting one out there? I think what Andy said about um, uh, just starting with a GoPro or something like that is a massive help. I, I've noticed people. About a year or two ago, people suddenly, audio became the new thing to criticise. Everybody was audio, an audio engineer all of a sudden. Uh, and that's particularly frustrating on launches, actually, because we're obviously we all want, everybody wants to hear what the bike sounds like, and we want to hear what that sound, bike sounds like. It's frustrating on launches sometimes because you generally can't take a camera crew with you. So you try to film what you need yourself while you're uh, riding the bike on roads you've never ridden, on a bike you've never ridden. And I, I find that quite, not stressful, but uh, it's... Yeah, actually stressful, uh, but fun. Um, but the frustration when you get back and you get the video back from the manufacturer and there's no um, engine sound, all you can hear is uh, the camera crew talking to each other. Yeah, no! And then you get all the complaints about it. But I think audio is important. So uh, if you've got a budget to buy some kit, I'd say don't just blow it all on a fancy camera. And also don't 
think you have to buy the fancy DSLRs and stuff. You know, I use DSLR because it's my, um, you know, the camera I have. Uh, but you don't, I don't think you have to spend a fortune on a camera. You're, you're most, everybody's watching this stuff on YouTube, but most are going to be watching it on a telly at 1080. My um, uh, daughter's best friend, her dad, works with BBC World Service, and they film everything in 1080. They're not shooting 4K. I mean, they're using some pretty fancy kit, but he'll often use second cameras, just GoPro. Um, and the GoPro audio is good, pretty good. But yeah, spend what you can, but don't, I'd say don't go mad, certainly when you're starting out, and use your phone. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I, sorry, Luke, I spoke over you there. I am um, very kindly, Luke uh, told me this question might come up. So I actually made five quick basic tips for ah. people that might be starting out. <laughs> the first one was spot on, uh, I think, John. And my first tip was don't worry about the kit. Um, you know, you don't need expensive cameras and mics. Um, you, all you need is a phone. That's tip number one. So we covered that one. Second one, uh, do make sure, having said that, do make sure people can see and hear you. So um, so you do need a certain level. I mean, the phones these days are so advanced. That's, that, that is all you need. But if you're going to do vlogging and on a motorcycle with a helmet um, cam and you're going to speak, then you do need to make sure people can hear you. One of the things that frustrates me when I look at new YouTubers sometimes, I often get people say, oh, look at my channel. What do you think of it? And often you can't hear them when they're actually on the bike if they're trying to speak. So, so that's an important one. The third one, uh, with nothing to do with technology, just be yourself. Don't try and copy someone else's style because, again, that you know, we've all seen the big YouTubers that have amazing production values and everything else, uh, and, and a certain approach to making videos. If you try and copy them, people will soon see through that. Um, so you, you can't be a fake. You've got to sort of develop your own style, basically. I, I would say, otherwise, people just just won't watch. And I find nothing more that, of a turn off than someone that is obviously trying to copy uh, copy Casey Neistat, for example. You can't emulate him, he's too good. Um, next one, um, well, I've mentioned this already, actually, don't go into it thinking it's gonna make you rich, because it won't do. Um, I spend a lot of hours doing this. So I spend probably 10, day, uh, 10 hours a day, seven days a week doing YouTube-related stuff. And when you work out the you know the payback, I get much less than minimum wage for doing this, so you ain't gonna get rich. Uh, and then the last one, um, if you do go into it intending to make something of it, you've got to consider it as a long-term game as well. Um, again, I mentioned my first video I posted in 2008, so it's taken me 12 years to get to this point uh, where people ask me to come on interview programs like this. Um, so it is a long-term game. You have to be consistent, keep doing them. Uh, don't be disheartened, like you said before. You'll get a lot of uh, negative uh, comments as well as the positive ones. Luckily, 99% of comments are positive, but it's the 1% that really get you to the heart of the ones that I remember vividly all the time. You need very broad shoulders as well. So uh, if you're of a weak constitution, don't go into it. So that was that was my top six tips. How do you get your mic set in your helmet to record so well? Because it's really tricky, isn't it? Uh, well, it, it, it can be, trial and error, basically. I did make a video on this, actually, if you want to search uh, how to set up your <laughs> mic for video vlogging, you'll find it. Um, but you know, basically, I just the trick for me, and this one, really, I got this tip from my flying, my aviation background, where you know where you wear the headsets in an aeroplane, it's a very noisy environment. In an aeroplane, they'll never work unless the mic is literally on your mouth. So, uh, so I thought it's a similar sort of environment. So I get the mic as close as I can to my lips. So uh, it's pretty much touching my mouth, the mic. Um, and that's how I do it. And, and trial and error, different helmets vary. But generally speaking, I don't, I don't have too much problem with that. I, I sometimes wonder why people struggle. I think a lot of the time people think that you're just using the audio out of the camera, but you do need an external mic plugged in. Uh, so that's what I do. Try, I, I think I've been a bit lucky actually in, in some respects. No, I love it. I think something you said about not being somebody else. I remember when, when I worked on Bike Magazine actually, because I was a designer for years before all the way through working through EMAP and Bauer, and it was only when I went to Morton's and edited Motorcycle Monthly, Motorcycle Sport and Leisure, I became a proper writer. Uh, but uh, And I say that very loosely. I did a lot of writing when I was a, a designer and art editor, but I just remember being at Bike Magazine, it was when I was working with Dan Walsh, who was an incredible writer. You remember him, don't you, Luke? He's a nice, uh, an incredible writer. Um, but I remember writing something, and Steve Westlake, before I wrote it, saying to me, whenever you write, just write as if it's you talking about it. Don't try and write like anybody else. And I think he's absolutely right. And I wrote that first thing I'd written about a bike um, from how I'd chat about it down the pub to my mates. And he's like, this works really well. Obviously, you know, I've had a lot to learn. I've still got a hell of a lot to learn. But I think, yeah, being yourself is vital, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, the downside comes if you're unlucky and by being yourself, you're a bit of a knob end. Uh, so that's not, that's that's not good. That's why my numbers so... are so poor. <laughs> so there is a bit of luck involved. Yeah. I mean, talking about the negative comments, I mean, how, you know, how do you deal with that? I mean, because that's the sort of thing that would put off 
I guess a lot of people, you know, you're out there, you're putting yourself out there to, for criticism. You're doing this because you, you want to enjoy it or you want to make a career out of it. But like you say, YouTube just bring out those keyboard warriors who, yeah, they always either complain about the audio or, or just they don't like you. But, you know, you said you remember those. I mean, to the pair of you, you know, how do you deal with those? John, John you get more than me. You go first. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, it is harder because, obviously, I work for an insurance company. Um, uh, so partly, obviously, we're an insurance company. Uh, and also, you have to consider your responses um, as a representative of a business. Um, when I worked um, at Morton's, there was a point where I started responding to people how I wanted to respond to them. And then realised it was massively unprofessional and I had to stop. Uh, my thing actually is what I have to keep taking because it, it I, I used to have YouTube my work YouTube on my phone as well and I took that off because I found that while I was out for a walk with my daughter and everything I'd just be looking at it and like oh, I need to respond to this so I just took that off but at home I find the best thing is if, if I'm starting to fret about it just delete it it's the easiest way just get rid of them I mean I'm not talking about people where you go oh look okay look, I get why you, you're upset or why you don't agree or why you might have a problem with something else um, and then you can engage with somebody and try and talk to them and, and explain how things are. You know, they'll do that a fair bit, but some of you just have to think, no, I delete. And sometimes I do go and have a look at their channel and see the other things that they watch and like. And sometimes it's really frightening. So then I delete them, hide them, and never go near them again. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm much the same. I, don't, I, t I try not to delete anything, actually, because I like people to see, uh, you know, the other side of this stuff as well, uh, to some degree. Um, because also I know other YouTubers that have had, uh, you know, got criticised for deleting comments. So I try not to do that. If they're um, absolutely obscene and outrageous, I, I will delete and ban people. But that's only happened in a small handful of cases. Uh, in terms of um, trying to deal with it, I mean, like, like you say, you just, I mean, we know what the advice is, is just ignore them at the end of the day. Um, you know, they've got nothing better to do. But uh, all that said, it is quite difficult to do that, particularly if they're, you know, if they are very personal or if they do something, if it goes more than the comments, so I won't go into details, but I've had a few things happen to me that are physical things as a result of, not I've been beaten up or something like that, but uh, you know, I've, I've had stuff like my bank account details published and uh, people have followed me onto my driveway and stuff like that, um, which you could really do without. Um, so, so there's a bit of that as well, which is, which is more tricky to deal with. The, the, the bad comments, I mean, at the end of the day, it's just a comment. You just got to let them go of your head, but it goes back to what I said before. You've got to, uh, you've got to be, fairly of sound mental stature i think to uh to take it because uh let's face it we don't all like everybody do we and and, and you can't keep everybody happy so uh you know i get so much grief just about my catchphrase for goodness sake i'll get i'll get a load of haters just in the first four seconds of my videos <laughs> what is your catchphrase i'm not saying it i don't like it myself that was a, that was another bit of advice if you're going to come up with a catchphrase make it a good one that doesn't have Jim, jimmy savile overtones <laughs> Like John says, it does put us in a difficult position because we have to try and, you know, obviously be professional and, and everyone's entitled to opinion, of course. And, you know, when we, we, you sit and watch telly yourself or your family, you'll always comment on, oh, what's this idiot? What's he doing? You know, and it's it's the fact you can actually put uh, put the words in a box and, and let someone read it. But I guess the weird thing is sometimes there was a comment um, the other day that I was responding to. I can't remember what it was about, but it was, it was somebody complaining about something that was they clearly weren't a motorcyclist and had no interest in the thing, but they were moaning about the video. You're like, but there's there's so much content on YouTube. Why did you choose to watch this then? Yeah, uh, it's nuts, and it's not like it's compulsory. No. And uh, <laughs> the other the other way I deal with it, I quite enjoy. Actually, I quite enjoy the challenge of it. I quite just like playing around with the English language generally. But uh, I quite like to be the the worse the comment is, the more polite I'll be in the response. Yeah. And uh, I find that quite a fun challenge, and you can't <laughs> do any harm with it. And the and the interesting thing is, although I, get, I find that quite a fun challenge. Probably, I would say without exaggeration, seven times out of ten, if you do that, the person comes back and apologises for their original comment and says that I was at a bad, I was in a bad place. I don't know why I said that. So it's very interesting uh, reflection on the human condition. I think. I think people forget that there is, you know, somebody put put a lot of effort typically into a video, put a lot of work into it. Whether or not you think they did as good a job as you could do, uh, or whether it was the best video it could have been, you know, they they put a lot of work into that, and they are ultimately a person with their own life and family and you know worries and everything behind it as well and it's easy to you know uh, yeah just think would you say that to somebody go up to the and say say it to their face 
I oh, know. I actually, I often re retort that and say, if you met me in the street, would you say that to me? And obviously they wouldn't. But uh, the other interesting thing, actually, when you were saying about being professional because you're part of Bennett's, etc., cetera, uh, that's another good bit of advice, I think, just for YouTubers starting out, because YouTube are very hot. They have a set of policies and so on. So things like um, when I, again, decided I was going to try and make a go of this, I made a sort of policy decision to myself that I wasn't going to swear on, on YouTube. Of course, in the real world, I do swear. But if you if you end up doing a lot of that on YouTube, number one, you could get banned, but also you can't, you know, you'll be demonetized. So there's a downside. So again, start as you mean to go on. So even though I'm, uh, I think part of the appeal of my channel is that I am a sort of an amateur and it's all, and it's amateurish in many ways. Um, I do try and be a bit professional about the way I go about doing it. So um, you know, watching your language, not uh, not having to go against other YouTubers as much as I'd like to, or anything else like that. So uh, yeah, I think you need to be you need to be professional about it, regardless of whether you actually work for an organisation doing. It. Whose videos do you particularly admire on YouTube? Then I'll ask this to to both of you. It doesn't have to be motorcycling, but one motorcycling example would be good, and and one generic that you could either you're sort of inspired by, or you think oh, I like that style, or you just enjoy watching. So there's a couple. There's um, there's one for production value, and one for just just good content so just to demonstrate what i mean by both so the production value one is a motorcycling one it's a guy called jamie he runs a channel called moto geo don't know if you've seen that um i know jamie excellent yeah yeah you, you probably know him personally do you yes yeah um, yeah i mean he comes across as a lovely guy funny dodgy northern accent but he can't help that um but he he, he lives now in la so it's a different slant on biking even though he's a brit um and he puts a lot of uh, a lot of effort clearly into producing his videos in that he, he produces one maybe a week maybe a one every couple of weeks. Um, but they're always amazing to look at. The visuals are great. So so that's one from production value. And also, he's, you know, I've, I've subscribed to him for years. He's a, he's a great fellow all around, it seems, on his. And then, and then in terms of content, Jamie. it's not a motorcycling one, but it's one that leapt to mind when you said it. It's uh, Harry's Garage. Do you know Harry Metcalf? He used to run Evo magazine. Um, so it's predominantly a car yeah, yeah. channel. But he does, he is a biker as well. He does have a big collection of motorcycles. Uh, and he's, I just enjoy him because again, he is very, he doesn't put lots of effort into production value. It's all done. I think his wife probably videos a lot of it. Um, but it's not fancy editing and lots of edited quick cuts and music and all that sort of thing. He's just got a real passion about the cars he's talking about. And that comes across in the videos. And uh, so and so that's real, why I really like that. And that's reflected in, in his sort of subscriber numbers as well. So uh, yeah, for me, Two, I mean, there are loads of examples, but two off the top of my head, Harry's Garage and Moto Geo. If you haven't watched those, go and check them out. Cool, yeah, good. Uh, for me, motorcycling, it's one actually they're not doing anymore, but it's, um, is it Motorcycle? Uh, American Motorcycle Mag, Zach Courts. Oh yeah, that'd be good. Yeah, Zach Courts and, oh, up us out. The other fella, yeah, yeah, I can't remember. They went to some pay-per-view channel, didn't they? Yeah. So good, I really love their videos, uh, and they did some great ones on Groms. On the Groms, uh, yeah, yeah, they were Yeah, I ended up buying a Grom. Um, for uh, the ones that frustrate me in motorcycling, or well, actually, no, but across YouTube, really, the ones that frustrate me are where they're. Uh, I get it, go into a lot of um, photography YouTube channels, and there's still a lot of really good stuff, really good tips and stuff, and, and gear reviews, but you start to realize slowly as you end up using some of the kit that they're using, sometimes you start to think, Mm, this is more product placement than a proper review and I, I'm like super anal about product reviews because it, you know it's what I did at Ride for years and it's what I do now is about being completely honest with something and people won't believe you you say this is really good but, yeah you're being paid to say that no because we're lucky that we're established enough and been in the industry long enough that if we review something and say this isn't very good we're not worried about whether we're going to get something else to review or anything like that but anyway my, my other favourite channel is definitely Donut Media uh I just love donut stuff. They do a bit of bike stuff, but uh, the car's just awesome. Like, you know, I dream of being as good as that, but I know they put a hell of a lot of work into that stuff. It's a big team now. But... I'm going to have to check that out. I, I actually, another one that just came to mind as you were talking there that I should have mentioned as well, because I'm sure you've all watched him, is uh, Ryan at Fort9. Uh, Again, he this is based on a business. I think Fortnite is a Canadian like kit distributor or something. Yeah, Canadian shop, isn't it? But yeah, yeah. yeah but he, uh, I mean, he puts at him and, and there's a couple of other guys I think that work with him, or at least one other. They put amazing uh, um, effort again into the videos. So the production value is amazing. But the other thing I like about them is they always look at subjects that, from a different sort of angle that anyone else has done. Um, so they only post relatively infrequently now, but that's because they put a lot of effort in. The visuals yeah. are great, but also their comedy. They, it's got a good comic angle on it. And one of the regrets that I have about my channel is I, I actually quite like having a laugh. And uh, that never comes across in my videos because they're, they're always a bit sort of um, stayed or whatever. So I'm not necessarily, 
people say you're not yourself, but I mean, obviously it's me on my videos, but I'm not the me that you'd meet if you went down the pub. Uh, so I kind of, I would like to get a bit more of that into my videos, but again, it's a fine line, isn't it, between crossing that border of professionalism. But Ryan at Fort Nine seems to get that just right, I think. What about you, Luke? What do you like to watch? Uh, not Dan TDM. <laughs> Is that all you get to see on your YouTube? That guy's... Mo the voice. Oh, his voice just cuts through me. I actually took the kids to see him live, and it was great and entertaining, and, and they love it. But from a motorcycling point of view... Um, I like I like forty four teeth. Uh, probably it's yeah. the humour that's more fit with me. But the, you know, it's you know you can't help but smile and join and and follow that and the adventures. Um, I know the guys, but I'd I'd watch it if I I didn't. Um, and yeah. I've I've been around uh, um, Al Fagan and just been crying laughing at him. He's and and Donut Media. You put me onto onto them before, John. I've really sort of gone down the line of their videos, and it's it's really slick the way they put those together. I haven't heard of those before. I'm definitely going to have to look those up. Even my wife started watching it the other day. I was saying, oh, I'm going to watch this video about this car. And she got well into it. James Pumphrey, yeah, he's really good. You know, we, talk, we talked about sort of, you know, the reasons for going to start your own videos. But and we've sort of brushed upon equipment a bit. But if we talk about bike reviews um, and what to go out and do that, I think that's probably, you know, a lot of people watching this, well, they've got a bike, they've probably got a smartphone. So how should they set about making their first one? What should be the kind of way to go? Because motorcycling, we love them. It's, you know, they're so excitable. But putting that across on video so it's coherent and kind of has a, a kind of story to it, it kind of makes sense, although my question hasn't made sense, you know, what are your top tips to kind of do that? I mean, I put this into perspective. I went to a KTM press launch in February and I've done lots of press launches and I've done lots of pieces to camera, but that was the first time I'd, I'd gone out for a very long time and talked on camera whilst what, riding. I had to think about the shots, do some social media, where to put the cameras, and you're constantly here, there, everywhere. And like you said, John, it can be quite stressful and flustered, but if you've got the time to take out a bike for the day, what would be your approach to do that and to try and come back with a video you know, to make at the end of that? Well, for me, I think it's, um, and again, this is just how I do it, so I can't speak for anyone else, but um, I think keeping it simple is quite quite important. So um, like you say, you can make it very complicated. And if you want to go down the route of having really high production values, multi-cameras, et cetera, et cetera, that makes everything more immeasurably more complicated and more stressful. Uh, and you could be more worried about whether your various cameras are running and stuff rather than what you're talking about. So. So for me, I think my sort of advice would be try and keep it simple if you're going to go down that sort of bike review route. Um, so personally, I only use a helmet mounted camera. Sometimes I have a forward facing one as well if I'm feeling like, you know, I want to do a double the amount of editing. They definitely come out as better videos that way. But to start with, uh, I would just try and keep it simple. Um, and, uh, and I guess the other thing is if you can come at it with an angle that's, and I don't do this, this is just what I think would be good, um, an angle that's not just a straightforward bike review, because at the, at the end of the day, bike reviews are what get you big, big view numbers. I, if I just wanted to get big viewers on my channel, and, and luckily for me, I'm kind of past that stage now. I just focus on doing things that I'm interested in myself. I still do the odd bike review. But uh, if you just want to get big numbers, go and do loads of bike reviews of the latest and greatest uh, bikes. You'll get lots of people watching them because, of course, YouTube is a search engine and people will search out, you know, KTM Super Duke R bike review and bingo, up will come a YouTube, uh, up will come a YouTube video. So that's a way to get to get your numbers up. Um, but if you can find a way of doing it that's um, not just the sort of thing I do, riding along, telling people what it feels like and then doing a walk around and talking through the spec because that's been done to death. Now, the reason why I do that is because that's how I started out doing them years ago and there weren't that many people doing it at the time. So that's kind of how mine have turned out and people sort of expect from me. But I would sort of like to do something a bit different. And again, if you could bring humour into it or another angle somehow, then I think you'd be onto a winner. But because it's now relatively crowded space, it's that much harder to find a niche for you, for you to, uh, your sort of light to shine amongst everyone else, isn't it? So, don't know what you think about that. Yeah, no, I, absolutely. I'd say, definitely if you're starting out, um, when I started at Morton's, I thought, oh, I'll start recording stuff while I'm riding. And it's a good few years ago, probably six years ago. I thought I'll have a camera on and record it while I'm on a launch. And it was just too much to think about. So I think you do need to get into that mindset of being able to do the talking while you're doing it. Don't pile everything on yourself all in one go, because what's most important is you ride safely. Um, but yeah, getting that different angle to it, I guess. And also, like, reviewing bike kit is easier in a way. I, I want to be super, I, I don't think anybody should go away from anything thinking, 
okay, what about this? I need to look this up somewhere else. And I also always treat every reviewer as if I recommend it to my best and most skint mate. Um, but with kit, it's, it's a lot easier to say whether it works or not, whether it's waterproof, whether it, beyond, you know, protection if you crash, because hopefully we don't crash in the stuff. The but bikes are so subjective, aren't they? Yeah, sorry? Bikes are so subjective, aren't they? Exactly, yeah, and I can honestly, I, I, I've enjoyed every bike I've ever ridden except one. Uh, and Oh, do tell. Yeah, I'm going to keep that one for now. <laughs> uh, but it's... Fancy saying that. <laughs> One yeah, day. these two have got Royal Enfields in the garage. They weren't that? No, I love that. It's, yeah, it's hard to get across that a bike can be good. So I think it's always think about who the typical audience is likely to be for a bike. So I often test bikes that I wouldn't necessarily buy. I remember doing a test once and somebody said, yeah, but would you buy it? I'm like, no. Well, well, it's rubbish then. You're lying. I'm like, no. If I, if I had to buy every bike that I said was really good, well, I couldn't. You know, I've, I've got three bikes and I, I haven't got the money or the space for any more. Um, but you, you have to detach yourself and think, if I was in that position, would I want to buy this? And in, in that respect, then you can be reviewing something like a Tracer 900 and say, look, the engine's great. You know, it's got this great character. Obviously, I'm summarizing now whether the brakes work, stuff like that. But it's also thinking about the things that somebody who buy that might want to know. Would they be likely to be carrying luggage and a pillion? And in that case, then you want to know what's the low capacity like. And the, that's where the Tracer can fall down because it's homologated for quite a low um, low capacity. So that gets my geekiness out. That so can, so that, that. that's the difference between you and me, John. You say you're a professional and you think these things through properly. That's exactly <laughs> what people would want to see. I'm just thinking, uh, you know, if you fall off and you record that or if you can find a nice uh, bird walking on the street and take a picture of her backside for the thumbnail, then you're not going to win her. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and actually the G310 GS. Actually, I crashed the, the G310 GS. We went on the launch of that and it, it was a very, very unusual one in that BMW said, we'll give you another space to take a videographer out. So we're like, yeah, cool. So we took the videographer out, and I remember we were shooting it backwards and forwards on this gravelly bit. I'm rubbish off road. And I started getting the back out, and I was like, oh, Rich, Rich, come out, come over here and film this. I'm getting the back out. And then I crashed it. Nothing bad. I bashed my knee, but that was it. And the bike was fairly undamaged. But loads of comments going, oh, convenient, you crashed in front of the videographer. So I, I know. Like, I mean, <laughs> it was real. But also, it gives you the opportunity to say, crash. But, it's like... but I think, like you say, people are looking for reviews of things, and hopefully people are looking for lots of opinions. So I guess the main thing is to make sure people know who you are and what you enjoy. So I'll try and put into context, you know, I, these are the things I like to buy. I love my ZX6, my SR and XR. I'd say whether I think something's good and then whether I buy it based on what I like. Uh, and I think that's the main thing, really. Is, yeah, be, be yourself, but also make sure people know who you, not do you know who I am, but, you know, know what, what your likes and dislikes are. Yeah, and there's another angle. I mean, like you said, a lot of this is subjective, so it's only your opinion. A lot of it. If you, you know, I often focus about about how a bike makes you feel. So I recently rode the new Triumph Rocket Three, and it makes you feel cool as hell, doesn't it, riding that bike? Uh, and that's a big thing. And for me, for part, big part of biking is how it makes you feel. So, so there's that. And then the other thing is, of course, there, there as I'm sure we had this discussion once before. There's not, there's no such thing as a bad bike on the market really anymore, is there? No. Um, I mean, I'm sure if you look hard, you can find it. But the sorts of bikes that we tend to ride are all are all good. It just yeah. depends, like you say, what the mission is that, you're, that you've got yeah. in mind. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's a leisure industry we're in, motorcycling or, you know, we all ride them, we all ride different things. You know, we don't all go after the same, you know, partner. So there's so much variety there and there aren't many bad bikes at all now. It just depends what you want to use them for. So we're, most of the time we don't need bikes, do we? we there's, there's something we, we just want them. So we want to be positive about them and we all want to talk about them. We want to get that point across, but... Yeah, I guess it's um, subjectiveness is you're always going to get opinions. You know, you go on Facebook and put something about how the government's handling the situation we're in now and you'll, and you'll get a load of things. And it's the same, put an opinion about a bike on, on uh, YouTube. I mean, John, the comments you get on, on the product tests uh, against um, bike reviews, are they fairly different? Don't tend to get as many. On, well, <laughs> yeah, the one that really stuck with me, actually, was when I cut up uh, an ally, an old ally, and a box. It was an hour I'd used for years. It was way past its sell by date. You know, I'm lucky that I test a hell of a lot of kit. Um, but I cut them up with an angle grinder and the amount of comments that are still coming through about how dangerously I use the angle grinder. It's like, I use, I use angle grinder for testing chains or test chains and locks. And yeah, it was a bit cack handed the way I was doing it, but nobody seems to complain about all the fabricators and that that don't wear gloves. The reason I didn't wear gloves is that um, I only had thick gloves. The only gloves that'd be any good against a, a 1.2 mil cutting disc would be really thick and using a small angle grinder it's just going to get wrapped up in it so i didn't use gloves it would have gone through it anyway 
What I wish I'd done was use a respirator because, yeah, that was stupid. <laughs> it filled the Gary. He's that's letting it get to, isn't he? Those comments are getting deep. Yeah, you see, that's my problem. That's my problem. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I start ranting, but... But no, um, no, we don't tend to get as many comments about uh, Kit, but also we don't um, get as many comments at all. Uh, it's, it's more emotive about bikes um, and more the videos we're doing about bikes. When we do the written stuff, it's more questions, really. People asking, you know, do, you, do you think, what do you think of this product or something like that? Uh, and yeah, we'll always try and help, but we'll always respond to stuff. And I, I did keep responding to the thing, going, yeah, you know, uh, this is why I didn't use gloves. And, but in the end, you get tired of that. You're like, I can't keep saying the same thing. <laughs> Yeah, I end up doing that pinned comment thing. Have you yeah, yeah, that's that. right. yeah, that's quite good. Yeah. I mean, I made a video recently, I can't remember what it was about, but I, I made some errors in it or I, or I didn't cover something. Oh, no, that's it. I was talking, it was a topical one. It was talking about how to store your bike if you can't ride it because, you know, I'm not riding my bikes at the moment. Um, and I covered you know, the sorts of things that I thought of, but I hadn't, I didn't do as much research as maybe I could have done. I missed a couple of key things, which were kind of obvious, but my goodness me, about a thousand people said it at the same time. In the end, I just pinned the comment and said, I know I missed the following and wrote them down. And luckily it sort of quelled those comments, but... Uh... That is a frustration with YouTube, I think, because you can no longer put graphics on after the video's been up. Because you used to be able to put something on and go, no, I got this wrong. Yeah. This is, this is my yeah, that's good. Yeah. Uh, and that, that's what stresses me out about videos, because you, you know that you're going to miss something. And that's why I much prefer writing things to be more considered and you can, you can get it all in there. But I think as well, from our point of view on our YouTube channel, we're doing a different kind of thing, but also we're seen as still being kind of slightly faceless. We're seen as being a, a business doing stuff. And that one thing I noticed was when you did uh, your first using ACF 50 and you couldn't get the compressor to work. And yeah. I remember not, not being frustrated at you, but being frustrated thinking if we'd done that, we would get so slated. But you, everybody's going, hey, nice one, TMF. Why don't you try doing this? Yeah. Uh, that, and I think that there's is a, a difference in what people expect from different channels. Um, yeah, isn't that interesting? And that's to my advantage because I've never claimed to be an expert at anything. I, again, this is one of our policy decisions. Don't come across as you know, like you know what you're doing, whether you do or not, because that's going to that's gonna you know, come and sting you. Uh, so, yeah, and actually those videos that where things go wrong, they tend to be the ones that get the big views, don't they? Yeah, yeah. And again, a bit like you, I had a comment once on, uh, I, I, can't remember, I can't exactly remember which one it was, but where somebody thought I'd faked it, I'd done it deliberately. Uh, just to get views, which I've never ever done anything like that. Yeah. I mean, I've had one or two fortuitous things happen. We did this, um, we did that bike v plane video. I don't know if you watched that one. Oh yeah, yeah. Where where we racing bikes against a light aeroplane, and the the plane would have won. There's no doubt about it. Um, but unfortunately, I had an issue with the aeroplane. I had to get it fixed before we could even take off. So um, you know, and that wasn't fixed, but it made for a much better video. It'd been really boring otherwise. We'd have just been there having pints by the time they got to the park. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking about, about your, your flying side. If you had the voice of a commercial airline pilot, your videos would have never taken off. <laughs> it's funny, and a lot of you should have taken off there. I, um, it's <laughs> funny, I had a number of people ask me if I was a commercial pilot before I even revealed that I was a pilot. So uh, isn't that weird? Oh, I thought you were a local uh, radio DJ. <laughs> well, that was, that's, my, um, that's what I wanted to be, believe it or not. I used to work, I worked for the BBC for a short period of time. That's where I thought I was Look going. Look at your microphone. I mean, it's a little slick setup that is. <laughs> this, I'll tell I'm you what, doing things like this and like... live streams, <laughs> doing things like live streams, which just blow my mind that I can be sat here in my study in Buckinghamshire and I can broadcast at a moment's notice just by pressing one button that is tantalisingly close to me and I can broadcast the world and you can get a thousand people watching at the same time and then more afterwards. It just blows my mind that you can do that. Um, the technology that's available to us now to do this, I mean, that's we talked about the way that things have changed over time, but just the technology that is available to us now is amazing, isn't it? And uh, I still, I'm, I'm amazed that a telephone works. So the fact that we can do all this is just incredible, isn't it? Well, I think when we, we try to explain this to our daughter uh, about what lockdown would be like if we didn't have Netflix, Amazon Prime, the ability still to order things and uh, everything that we can still do. Um, yeah, we're pretty lucky, really. Oh, gosh. Right, well, I think um, that's a good point to, to wrap up the video. We've been chatting on enough. I wonder what the sort of uh, comments we're going to get on this, and I probably um, we probably encourage some more uh, hateful, negative comments. Yeah, probably disable the comments from the start. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you know, thanks for uh, thanks for your your time, Andy and and John on that. I think um, you know people can get hopefully get some hints and tips on that. You know, we're at the moment we're locked in, but maybe this is a chance for people to sort of try making their own videos, which is why um, on Bennett's Rewards we've created a guide on how to make one with just with just smartphone and that. 
Uh, looking forward to seeing what, what videos you're going to be putting out in the next coming weeks, Andy. You, you say you work quite far and ahead with with your... Uh... Yes, luckily, luckily, one of the things I do do is plan in ahead what I'm going to do. I have a little schedule and it runs out, uh, believe it or not, I know what videos I'm making up until about next January, or I did. It's been rescheduled slightly now. Um, but generally speaking, I have about two months worth in the can before they go up with some interjected, some topical ones that go in before then. So I'm quite lucky I've got a lot of stuff in the can that I can still keep putting out even though we're in lockdown. And then I get uh, then I get criticised for riding my bike and it looks very busy where you live, but that's because they were recorded back in January. But uh, And you've got yeah, a full so head of hair. Like, yeah, exactly. Well, I wish, I wish. But no, it's been, it's been great joining you. So thank you for uh, inviting me along. I'm happy to do it any time of night. I can chat for hours on this stuff. Go on, Andy, talk to you again. Really appreciate you not wearing lycra or wearing clothes as well, Andy, after your... Steady. Trying to, trying to attract a new audience with, uh, with some of those photos. So once again, I want to say thanks to uh, our sponsor for this episode, Sparta. So head to spartaclothing.co.uk to look at that. And in the next episode, episode six, we're going to be talking about an Isle of Man TT and classic TT special. So make sure you uh, tune in to watch that. Again, always happy to see the comments uh, you've got on the video, mainly positive ones and what we should do more of or less of. And thanks again to John and Andy. So until next time, stay home, stay safe. And be nice to your neighbours. Cheerio. Cheers. Lockdown haircuts you're sporting. Clippers? Yeah. I did think just now, I thought actually I might just take my trousers off. Are we all Stop. clapping for everyone? Okay, uh, have you both had a wee first? Yeah, but there's no guarantee I'll last for 40 minutes. <laughs>